Hey guys, I should have planned to have some really good background music going while we started. I'm sorry about that. I'll have to think about how I can do that. This is our first webinar and I'm really excited to have everybody here today. And while people are still putting their names and their um, towns that they're from in the chat box. I'm really excited to see some friends from all over Maine and from Vermont too. I'm glad you guys are here. I'm going to take a second and just go over a couple quick things. We've got 55 people on with us today, which is really exciting. And it, the number hasn't changed in a while, so I think we might be it so we can get going. I just wanted to welcome you um, to the 4-H Quarantine Virtual Science Cafe. I'm Laura Wilson. I'm a 4-H science professional, and I'm really glad you could join us. So 4-H, for those of you who aren't part of 4-H, I'm so glad you're here with us. We're a community for all kids with programs that suit a variety of backgrounds, interests, and schedules. We do programs in school, after school. We have clubs and camps. And our 4-H youth development programs are available in your local community. And we welcome every kid who wants to have fun, learn, and grow. In Maine, 4-H is brought to you by the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. And Cooperative Extension's experts and educators share university knowledge, information, and tools you can use every day to improve your life. I am going to share my screen just for a minute. <laughs> and make sure that you have that um, website at umaine.edu slash 4-H if you want to learn more about our 4-H programs in Maine. Thanks for taking a minute to introduce yourselves in the box. I just want to let you know that on this um, webinar with me today, in a in addition to Scarlett, we have Jesse Brainerd, who works at the State 4-H office in Maine. We have Alice Philbrick, who does a lot of work uh, connecting kids to campus and organizes a lot of great um, tours and trips to the University of Maine. Uh, we've got Dr. Vanessa Klein, who is our State 4-H STEM specialist. And we have Christy Olette, who's a 4-H educator out of Androscoggin, Sagadahawk counties, and she runs the 4-H programs out of that county. Now, we're going to keep this session really simple. So what's going to happen is our guest will share some of her cool science and tell us about herself and how she got to be a scientist. Then we'll have plenty of time for you to ask questions. There's a Q&A block down at the bottom of your screen. And you can use that at any time during this discussion to get questions to Christy, uh, to Scarlett. And I'm seeing a lot of chat in the chat box, which is great. I'm going to let you know that we cannot see you. So we cannot see you. We cannot hear you. So the way to communicate with us is through that question and answer box for questions for Scarlett or um, just general thoughts and introduce introductions in the chat box. So I'm going to ask you to be courteous and respectful today, but please do participate because this is supposed to be a science cafe. This is not school. This is not a lecture. This is us sharing with you and you sharing with us. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and thank you. And you don't have to take you don't have to turn off your cameras unless you would like to. I'm going to turn you guys over to Scarlett Tudor. Dr. Scarlett Tudor is going to introduce herself and tell our participants about herself and her research. Scarlett, you want to take yeah, it so first virtual science cafe? I'm so excited that you were willing to test this uh, session out with us. Yeah, I'm super excited about this. Um, I'm actually the uh, outreach and research coordinator for the Aquaculture Research Institute on the University of Maine campus. Gonna get my screen up here and going. Um, I was actually really excited uh, to kind of to do this with everybody today. Um, 
right before this, I found this meme and one, it's one of my favorite uh, movies, it's Finding Nemo. And we're all kind of in our respective plastic bags uh, right now, trying to, you know, still connect with one another. So I think that this is a, a really um, cool opportunity. So I'm really glad um, to be here. And I'm gonna talk to you just about uh, fish and sort of some of my research and some of the work that we do at the University of Maine. Um, and, you know, uh, 4-H for me actually was really how I started uh, my scientific career. Um, thinking back on it as an adult, like what are the things that I did even when I was young that kind of hinted um, to what my adult career would look like. And uh, I was in 4-H. I took, uh, you know, I had a pig, I had uh, chickens and ducks and geese, um, but I also had an aquarium. Um, and this is actually just a video from an aquarium that's in my house right now. And I actually, uh, I'm originally from Ohio um, and I went to the Ohio State Fair with my aquarium. So I got to take all my fish uh, to Columbus um, and show them off. And so even as a very young uh, kid, I was always really, interested in fish and I'll say all of my scientific jobs, I actually got them because I knew how to take care of fish. So um, through 4-H, I was able to learn how to care for fish. Um, it definitely helped me with just general animal husbandry, um, but it also really honed my observational skills, which has been something really uh, critical to my career as an animal behaviorist. Um, I also want to say that I'm, I'm happy to take questions like during, um, and I know there are, um, the 4-H folks are, are kind of uh, organizing those questions and stuff. So um, if something isn't clear or you're just interested in something, um, go ahead and, and let me know. And so the other thing that I want to do through this webinar is I'm going to have questions for you. Um, and so one, I want to kind of learn about what your level of knowledge is, um, but we're also going to watch some fish videos together and talk about their behavior. And so the first, one of the first misconceptions um, that I hear a lot is this idea that goldfish have a three second memory. And so I think we got a polling question, oops, up that how many of you have heard of this three-second memory. There you go. And I, I hope everybody can see that. We're getting lots of good answers to the poll. I want everybody to know that when you fill out these polls, we're not tracking who is answering what. So answer to the best of your knowledge. It's, it's not a quiz. No grades. This is for fun. No, this is all fun. And then you, if you just want to let me know when everybody's answered or what those results are. Yeah, I'm going to close the poll in about five more seconds. We've got close to 80% of people who have voted already. And for the poll, have you heard that goldfish have a three second memory? Let me share the results here. So 65% have not heard that and 37% and, um, had heard that. Yeah, so that's really, it's really interesting to me. Um, I usually ask this uh, in, a, in an undergraduate class and there's kind of a mix of people who've kind of heard this and those that haven't heard this. Um, and so I think it might not be a thing that we're hearing as often, um, but the fact that some of you have heard this idea that fish have a three second memory is interesting. And where does that kind of come from? And as an animal behaviorist, does that actually make sense? And so now what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to show you a few videos or a couple of videos actually. So in this video, you'll actually see what the goldfish does to kind of beg for food. Dogs or cats, I'm sure you're well familiar with animal begging, um, but this is the fish version of it. Yeah, so now it's getting fed. 
So you see this fish um, has learned to ring a bell, and if they ring this bell, um, that means food, which is, is kind of cool. Um, this next video, I hope it shows how complex uh, fish behaviors can be, and also their capacity for learning. I so your fish does kit. nothing. Until now. The R2 Fish School Kit. Everything you need to train your fish to do amazing tricks. So I might, and by might I mean I definitely have this kit uh, in my office <laughs> right now. Um, and again, um, you know, I think it, it shows the, the complexity of the behaviors that you can elicit in fish. And then so now my next question is that after seeing those videos, does this idea that fish have a three second memory make any sense? minimize my videos. People are responding to the poll really quickly with this with their answers right now. So we're almost up to about 80% of people who have responded. So I'm going to end the poll in five seconds. Yeah, so a majority of you thought, yeah, this, the three second memory doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense. And um, one of the reasons that these videos do suggest that is that I also know that there was training involved um, in getting the fish to do that. And if fish really had a three second memory, their lives would be much like this cartoon where, um, you know, a goldfish is talking to his friend and then is like, what, what's happening? And this would be problematic in the environment with fish are doing things like looking for food. So imagine if you forgot where the grocery store was every three seconds or that you were hungry and what to do about that. Um, so it's really important for all kinds of animals to have some uh, capacity for learning. So as an animal behaviorist, um, this sort of study and use of fish has sort of always existed. People have been interested in fish since Darwin um, and well before for all kinds of reasons. And um, one of the species that's been used a lot is this three-spined stickleback. Um, this is a species that we actually have in Maine. And what I'm going to show you in this video is their reproductive behavior. Scarlett, and so we have what a... you're seeing oh. in the video is there's a male. And the male is the one that has the red throat. And they also have really blue eyes. And this is a little nest that he's made. And the other fish is actually a female. So the females are different colors um, than the males. Females tend to be more drab. Um, than males, though there are species where the opposite is true. And so the male is kind of going through his nest, showing the female, this is my nest, this is my nest. And so what the female now is doing is she's going to go in and she's actually depositing eggs into this little nest. So right now, yep, she's depositing all her eggs. The male's kind of checking stuff out and now this male will go in and he is fertilizing the eggs at that point point. and what's interesting about sticklebacks and there are other species of fish that do this the male actually gives parental care so the male is going to take care of this nesting spot um, and uh, care for the eggs and the embryos inside until they're old enough developed enough uh, to move out of uh, the, the nesting space. 
And um, as you can see, those males that are really different colors, and we want to understand, okay, well, why do the males look different than the females? What, what's the benefit for that? And one of the first sort of classic examples of how we study, you know, how animals communicate and their behavior and why is it beneficial is with this stickleback experiment. And you can see here this little schematic. Um, in this next video I'm going to show you, what they're going to do is they're going to present a stickleback male that has a nest and they'll present him with a realistic like stickleback model. So a model that looks like a fish. But then they're going to also put in these other unrealistic models of the fish, but that have this red coloration. And so what we're asking is if this uh, response of the males is due to something that looks like a stickleback, or if this red coloration is really important. And so we're, I'm gonna ask you a question about this experiment after we watch the video. So as you're watching the video, really um, take note of what's the male's behavior towards each of these different stimuli um, or fish models and what might that tell us about um, the things that are important for a male to know your arrival male. So this is their realistic type model. And then different shapes and sizes. So this is a little male in this tank. This is his nesting territory down here. So kind of notice what that fish is doing. What is that male doing in the tank? And then this is another stimulus. Again, different size, different shape. But with that red, red coloration. Okay, so now as an animal behaviorist, what I would do is, okay, I've, I've watched their behavior, and then I can come up with some hypotheses about, okay, what did I see, um, and what does that mean? And so our next polling question then is, what do you think that that behavioral display tells us about stickleback aggressive encounters? and think closely about how did the male behave towards these different stimuli and which ones seem to elicit aggressive behaviors. So biting, fish also do a little bit of tail slapping. Scarlett, this is Jesse. I have a couple of questions I thought I, you might be able to answer while people are doing the poll. Um, we have, this is going back a couple of minutes, um, Kensington asked if that means that fish have a brain. Scarlett, were you able to hear Jesse? So I've just messaged Scarlett to see if she can hear us. I'm not she, sure she heard our question um, that Jesse read from one of the uh, 
question and answer boxes. Hang on just a second. We will get right back with you. Have most people answered? Hey, Scarlett, can you hear me? Yeah, and so um, most of us uh, got this right. And that's actually really cool for me to see because as a behaviorist, it, you know, it took me a while to figure out um, some of these things that I was looking at and, you know, what behaviors are, are meaningful and what do they mean. And so most of you got this right, that males are actually reacting to the red coloration. And we can have that hypothesis because the male in the beginning, when it was given this realistic model, it just kind of sat there. It didn't really respond to it at all. And if we think about it, this is sort of what the females look like. And so, of course, that wouldn't elicit a sort of aggressive um, response. But because they respond to these weird shapes that don't even look like fish, um, it's that red coloration that we know um, is really important. So nice work, everybody. Um, I got my sort of scientific start actually working with sword tails. They are live bears. Um, you see these at Petco, some variant of these. Uh, this picture is actually my advisor and I um, in a stream in Mexico, and this is a stain. So this is like a big net that we use uh, to catch um, different species um, that you can see along the bottom. And all of these different species of uh, sword tails I've worked with, they get their name because they have these long um, extensions out of their caudal fin or their back fin that kind of looks like a sword. Um, and so that's where they get their common name. Um, I'll also say I did my undergrad uh, at the Ohio University. So I have a lot of Ohio State in terms of 4-H. Um, and then I did my undergrad at university and I was really lucky my first year um, to meet a faculty member that was doing something on fish behavior. And so this little video will show you um, the fish that I worked with. Um, and right here is the male. And then there are females all around him. And if you, while you're watching, you'll notice one, their dorsal fin or that fin at the very top is always really erect. One, they're trying to make themselves look a lot bigger than they are. And so they spread their fins as wide as possible. And then you'll see the male is in front of another male. They kind of did a little tail slapping thing. And then they also do this figure eight display where they move um, to show their left and right sides. Uh, and they use these uh, behaviors to court females, um, but they also use them as deterrents for rival males. So the behaviors they're using in the presence of females and for males. And so then I'm going to ask, does everybody see the difference in morphology um, between these males and females? So this is a female and then this is a male. let that video play for you. Sitting and watching these fish, I don't want to tell you how many hundreds of hours of my life I've spent um, in front of a fish tank watching fish just do stuff. You can kind of see they're, they're feeding on some algae type pellet at the bottom there. And so the males can see that as a resource to guard. That's in part why um, you're seeing so much displaying. Plus there's a ton of females right there. Scarlett, can you hear me? 
Yes. We're almost to, um, we're over 75%, and so I'm going to shut down the poll. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so most of you can see that, that difference um, in the males and females. So these females have these brood spots, which we'll talk a lot about a little bit later. And females in general, like I said, they tend to be more drab or not quite as colorful um, as the males. And um, then this is the species that I, like again, I worked on many different sword tail species. And looking at these two photos, would you guess these are two males of two different species, or do these males belong to the same species? Hey, Scarlett, this is Jesse. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I have a couple of questions that go along with this. Um, Pablo has asked, are females the smaller ones and males the bigger ones? Yeah, so that question is, is yes. Although in these species, it's actually really interesting because males have determinate growth and determinate meaning they get to a certain size and then they basically stay that same size for the rest of their lives. But females, on the other hand, have indeterminate growth, meaning that they keep growing the older they get. So typically, females don't get as large as the largest males in the population, but females can get larger than some males. That's a really good question. I've got a couple more here, if you, if you don't mind. For a little bit, you couldn't hear me, it seemed like. We had a question from quite a, back when you showed the video of the of the athletic fish. Um, Bryn asked, but aren't they just born with some of those abilities, like how you are born knowing how to swallow and breathe? So there are some behaviors that are innate behaviors, though I would argue pushing a basketball into a hoop is one of those behaviors that doesn't really have any benefit to a fish in the wild. And so we can look at, okay, what would happen if I put a fish in, an, in a tank with a soccer ball? So do they even do anything with that at all? Do they recognize that as an object to interact with? And um, I know this because I've seen some of these training videos where the fish aren't really that interested, but how they teach them is they connect those behaviors with something that they do care about, like food. Um, and so just like we train our dogs, uh, you know, to sit and to do these things that we want them to do, um, we're able to train them to do that with food. But yeah, that's, that's a good question. All right, I've got one more and then, then you can go to whatever the results of this poll are. Um, Jen has asked, when you are using the net, have you ever picked up eggs? So, it's sort of interesting, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. These live bears are called live bears because they actually, females incubate their eggs on the inside and they give a live birth. And so their offspring, you never see them in an egg stage. Um, but with other fish, you do see eggs. And so, yeah, um, I have, but with a different species. And also with some salmon that I'll show you um, uh, later. Hey, Scarlett, thanks for that. We had a bit of a problem with the poll launching, but I've got people answering it now. And so we'll have those results for you in just a second. Okay. Yeah, I, one of the reasons I, I actually really like these uh, fish and live bears are used a lot in research because they have such a completely different way um, of reproducing. Okay, cool. So we kind of got like half and half on this. And, and while they look like they might be in two different species, these are actually one species. Um, these are quite interesting because the males gain access to females and they produce offspring in really different ways. 
So the quarter males, like you saw in the video, they spend a lot of time courting females, defending territories, where these little blue guys down here, they sneak copulations. Um, they don't defend territories. So um, their morphologies are very different because the little guys on the bottom, to do a good job, they have to be really small and agile, where the quarter males have to be really um, big and able to defend territories. So this is a cool species because um, the males have a couple of different ways of um, gaining access to females. And we know in general that females in this species prefer quarter males um, over sneaker males. So when we ask a female, which of these males do you prefer by allowing her to spend time with one male versus another, she spends a lot more time um, with the quarters. And so one of the things I was really interested in um, during my undergraduate was, okay, well, how do you get these different male um, types in a population? And what's the role of female preference? Um, for this. And so what I did was I actually exposed females to different frequencies of quarters to sneakers. So I basically used a cattle tank. I put some fish uh, in there um, and the yellow ones represent the quarters, the blue ones represent that sneaker type. Um, and what we see is that, that females where the frequencies are equal actually lose that preference for quarter males. So changes in their social environment actually result in changes in their mating preferences. And we sort of hypothesize that this is likely due to changes in male behavior um, in these different frequencies. And that was something I was working on when I left, but wasn't able to quantify that. So we still don't know what are the differences um, in these social situations, these different social contexts, and how that uh, affects female mate preference or who they prefer. Um, what are the this is, oh, can I ask oh, a quick yeah, question? I just have a couple, a couple quick questions before we keep yeah. moving on. Someone is wondering, um, in the chat box, we're wondering how big these fish get. Yeah, so swordtails are actually a pretty small fish. So males, you know, maybe two inches, maybe. Um, and females inch and a half when they're adult and full grown. And so these fish are found a lot in really um, smaller rivers. They can be in really shallow rivers to like a medium sized river and they're all found in uh, fresh water. Um, I have just a new question came in. Is it genetics that decide if the male is a counter or a sneaker? Excellent question. And yes, it is genetic. So there are, are different genes that are responsible for how large a male grows. Um, and males, like quarter males, so when a female has offspring with that quarter male, he always has quarter offspring. And when a female mates with a sneaker male, she always has sneaker offspring. So one of the projects we were actually able to do is um, take females from these different frequencies and then have them um, give birth to their offspring. Then we reared the offspring up to see what morphology they were. And then we could tell exactly who she had mated with. Um, so that's, a, that's an, awesome question and yeah there there is a genetic component to that and, and you know a lot about it actually and we have uh tovin is wondering how is this information used so one of the things that i would label myself as is an evolutionary behaviorist and that means i'm interested in understanding over long um many generation times or long periods of time how do these two phenotypes persist because if one does a little bit better job of having more offspring, then eventually over many generations, we would expect to only see one of these phenotypes exist in a population. Um, but there are several examples in other taxa. Um, there's an isopod that has a similar uh, genetic um, differences in reproduction. And so as a biologist, I'm un I wanna understand, okay, well, how does this happen? And what benefits do the males get from these different uh, strategies? 
but then how do they get equal numbers of offspring so that we constantly see both of these phenotypes persist? So again, it's about evolution and how do these uh, signals evolve, this fish communication, how does it evolve? And then what are the effects of that communication on different phenotypes? Um, we did have a question of, do the fish know if they're a sneaker or a quarter? How do they know that? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And most of their behavior is a meaning that their behavior is the exact same every time and especially for the quarters. And so they don't really have to consciously think about what phenotype am I? It's just that the genes for certain behaviors are linked with certain morphologies. And so um, they get kind of those genes for the behaviors and the morphologies, they get linked together. And then every time we see a quarter, he's got quarter type behaviors. And then every time we see a sneaker, we see sneaker type behaviors. So it's about correlations and their genes. These are some and, awesome questions. Oh, yeah, I have going back to the previous question about what you, how you use this information, Tobin clarified that they were wanting to know how this information can be applied to helping people or the environment. Yeah, so there's actually something really interesting about this uh, particular species. Um, how these, there are different size classes and the genes that regulate what size a male is, they're regulating growth rate. And what we're actually seeing is some of those genes can actually be um, used to work on human diabetes. And so this particular system is used to ask direct human health questions. Um, so like my advisor right now, she's doing work looking at if you give them a poor quality diet or high quality diet, how does that change growth rates for these different size classes? So it can actually, using fish like this can actually help us understand things about human genetics because the, um, the hormones in the genes that regulate fish growth are very similar uh, to our own. Um, so we're able to learn lots of things um, about human health. And, um, you know, there's also some work that I do, which I'll show a little later, about how we can understand the effects of contaminants on, on fish. And so I'm get this is Jesse again, I'm going to have people, if you want to keep putting your questions in, we're going to let Scarlett get through this section and let us know. And as soon as she's ready, I will read your questions off to her for her answers. Okay. Okay, so, um, so we've talked a lot about live bears, definitely one of my favorite kind of fish. And then we've talked a little bit about different kinds of reproduction. Um, and so I think when people think about fish often, you think about broadcasts. And what broadcast spawners are, are like something like an Atlantic salmon, where a female lays her eggs, those eggs go down into like a rocky substrate. And you can see here, these are actual salmon eggs. So they're very, very tiny. Um, and here, this is an eye up stage because you can actually see their eyes um, as they've developed. And then what happens is that these eggs hatch and then you get free swimming fry. And again, this is a salmon fry um, and this is its yolk sac. So this is all the energy that the mother has given to the fry to develop until um, it's able to fend for itself. And then to con contrast that with live bears that these females carry their eggs inside and then they actually give live birth. So for um, something like a live bear, you only see this stage. You don't see the, the eggs and the de that development part because that happens all inside the female. And then we'll talk a little bit like sticklebacks and some betas. Um, that these uh, females lay their eggs in these bubble nests that males produce, and then the males give parental care, um, just like in the sticklebacks. So these different sort of modes of reproduction also um, greatly influence uh, the reproductive behavior that we see in different species. Um, and so how many of you are familiar with betas?
people are jumping on this poll really quickly, Scarlett. I'm going to close. Um, I've already got 75% of attendees have already answered. I'm going to give a couple more seconds and then I'm going to um, turn it off and share the results. Yeah, okay, a lot of you, this is definitely a species that we see um, a lot at Petco when you go there. The, they're the ones that are in the little cups. And the reason they can live in those little cups is because they actually are able to breathe air. Um, and so they have a highly vascularized uh, mouth. So like our lungs, they have a lot of blood vessels that can exchange um, oxygen. So where we do that in our lungs, they're able to actually do that in their mouths. Um, and uh, here's a, a couple of, of males. One of the reasons I got really into these little guys as a, a research species is because they have really clear behavior. So what you see is you see these two males are kind of fighting. You can see their fins are really spread. But the other thing they're doing is this opercular flaring. So it's tissue that they have around their gills and they flare that out. I mean, again, like sticklebacks, they have nests and they deposit eggs in those nests. So defending a territory is really, really important for them because if they can't defend this nest against other males, the other males, they'll come in, they'll eat the offspring and then the male has lost um, all of his offspring. So there's another reason why I'm really interested in this, and um, it kind of links to people watching. So as a behaviorist, I kind of innately watch what other people are doing. And so after my PhD, I got to go to Harry Potter world. Uh, that was my present to myself. And when I'm in large groups like this, I often pay a lot of attention um, what people are doing around me. And so I'm interested in how many of you kind of, if you're in a large crowd, are kind of watching what other people are doing. I'm going to give about five more seconds on this poll. People are jumping right into it, too. Okay, awesome. I think after I get through um, this first set of beta slides, I want to stop and sort of ask questions. I don't, I won't probably get through all of the stuff that I had. Before. Yeah, so most of you do. Um, you know, we kind of pay attention to what other people are doing and we actually can learn about other people without actually directly interacting with them. Like if you overhear a conversation um, and, you know, so most of us kind of do that uh, with each other, but fish actually do this as well. And so when we thought about communication in fish in the beginning, we used to think about one signaler and a receiver. So somebody that's talking and then somebody that's listening and um you know this the sort of two person or two fish scenario isn't really realistic because um what's actually happened um this is not really too great but uh there are other fish around in close proximity that can actually watch these two individuals and what we know in betas is that these eavesdroppers that have watched an interaction between two individuals actually use that information when directly interacting with an individual that they watched. So fish can see two individuals interact with one another and then it changes how they interact with those individuals later. And so one of the things that we know is that males that have come across a male that they've seen win a fight or lose a fight, they behave differently towards them. And so what we see happening is that males that have recently seen a male win a fight, they really don't want to interact with that male and that they would approach a loser um, more readily. 
And this is all based on visual cues. So the way we've tested this is in um, watertight tanks so that we can only, so that the betas are only getting information um, from visual cues, which I think is really cool because then it means that these males are able to watch two other individuals um, have some interaction, they retain information about that interaction, and then they use it um, later. So I kind of, I think I want to stop there to just answer more questions. You all have come up with some awesome questions, so I want to make sure we have time um, to do that. Hey, Scarlett, before you start taking questions, I'd love yeah. to have um, people as we wrap up, because we're a little over on time, to tell us in the chat box what other topics they might like us to address in future science cafes. So Scarlett will take your, your questions through the Q&A, but while you're thinking about that and listening to the questions and answers, just let me know what else we can provide for you. And Jesse, take it away with some questions for Scarlett. Yeah, here, I'll actually stop sharing. All right, Scarlett, are you ready for some questions? Yeah. Okay, we have, there are a few that are the same, which I would love to group them together. We have um, several questions. How many babies do the fish have at once? Can fish have twins? How many eggs do fish lay on average? So I'm trying to group all those for you. Yeah, that's, those are really great, great questions. And it depends on what reproductive style they have. So for something like an Atlantic salmon, they have hundreds and hundreds of eggs at all at one time. It's partly because they're putting very little investment into each offspring. So they just have a whole ton of babies and um, knowing that a certain percentage of those offspring will make it to adulthood. So they can have hundreds and hundreds. We contrast that with something like a live bear. Um, they can have 12, 15 offspring at one time, depending on the size of the female. So for something like live bear, they just put a lot more investment into each individual offspring, so they often have way fewer. Related to that, um, we have the question, do guppies give live birth? Yes, guppies do give live birth. They are live bears, yeah. And if you look um, at guppies, and again, you see guppies in um, pet stores and that kind of thing, the males actually have a modified anal fin um, that you can tell when it's a male or a female, and they use that fin to transfer the sperm into the um, female. And then if you'll look at the guppies too, they also, females have what's called that brood spot or that black spot um, near the female's belly. And it's thought that that black or melanistic pattern helps protect um, the developing embryos inside from UV and other uh, sorts of things that might be harmful for them. And back to our, our big popular quarters and sneakers. Are quarters and sneakers born together and what are their coloration as eggs? Yeah, so it's interesting. They all look, even males, females, quarters and sneakers, all look the same when they're juveniles. And um, as they start to develop, they start being those different morphologies and those colorations. So the offspring of many fish, they tend to be really drab because it's too risky for them to be really bright um, because those colorations we know um, also stimulate predators. So predators, especially visual predators, are also really good at seeing those colorations. So when they're really young, um, they're very drab, very much like the females, just sort of a brown color. Um, and then once they hit sexual maturity, then just how humans change at sexual maturity, um, they have hormones that change their, um, their appearance and their, their pigment. All right, we've got a couple of questions about the betas, betas. Um, two that are sort of about their behavior. Uh, one is, do you think it's safe to have them as pets instead of leaving them in their natural habitat? And then also, 
when they're in the wild, wouldn't they live in bigger places? Would that affect the way they move, like how tigers pace when in captivity? Yeah, and so I, I will say I am somebody that um, enjoys a, aquaria and fish as a hobby. And I do think that if you are gonna have fish, they should be from an aquaculture source. Meaning that when we buy fish at a pet store, um, it's really important to know where those fish came from. So I tend to never buy fish that are wild caught for that reason. Um, I think that, you know, and actually with sword tails, it is one of those examples where um, as a scientist, I would go out into the field a lot and, um, you know, people would be illegally taking them from the wild for the hobbyist trade. So I don't think that we should be doing that. And aquaculture, again, is one of those really great things that we can use to both allow people to have these things as pets, um, but also to keep wild populations preserved. Um, you know, betas, even in their sort of natural habitat, especially males, because they're producing those nests, they don't really go that far from them. So in the breeding season and they have their territory, they really don't stay in super small places. That being said, I think for a beta, you need at least a five gallon tank, maybe a 10 gallon tank even. And I think that they're pretty happy um, in those situations. So I think that anybody that's interested and having fish as pets, one of the first things you should do is read about the species. What do they need? How big do they ultimately get? Um, because again, a lot of these fish, when they reproduce, people don't think of, you know, a, a baby sword tail is probably a couple millimeters. It's, it's very, 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 very small. And it gets, you know, way bigger than that as adults. And sometimes I see, um, fish in the Haas trade that I don't think we should have in the trade. I think goldfish for me are a good example of that because if people get them when they're tiny, um, but they can grow to over a foot and a half. Um, and you'd need 400 gallon tank, which most people aren't really prepared for that. So yeah, I, you know, I'm all for having fish in the hobby, but I'm also about doing it responsibly and making sure that we are preserving, um, wild populations. All right, we've got a few questions about betas and how they breathe. People are wondering how long is it before they breathe air or can they just breathe it because um, you said they breathe through their mouths, but do they have gills and do they have to breathe air or do they just do it because they can do it? They, they, do, they do both. And so to understand that question, we need to understand a little bit about what their natural what their natural environment looks like. And these guys live in rice paddies, very shallow bodies of water that are also very stagnant. And so because they're in these environments of stagnant, shallow water, it's the oxygen levels in the water can be naturally really low. And so they've evolved to have this additional organ that allows them to get water from air. Several fish uh, species that have done this, there's a whole group of fish called labyrinth fishes, um, and they're called that because it's the labyrinth organ, right? So that organ that they have that allows them, um, uh, oh, okay. So I actually just got a pro tip here from my army that they, have to breathe um, from the air um, or they'll drown. So like they do have gills, but the main way that they're exchanging oxygen is through that labyrinth organ. So through their mouth. And like I said, they have that or have evolved that because they live in environments that can have low oxygen um, in the water. Hey, I'm going to jump in for a quick second because we are over on time and I understand that some people have to leave and I totally get that. Um, I just wanted to thank Scarlett for coming out and hanging out with us. She can certainly stay on if she's got the time to answer a couple more questions, but we do understand if you do have to take off. Just a quick reminder that we will be coming back next week with another virtual Science Cafe with Dr. Allison Smart 
who is going to talk to us about um, moldy strawberries or maybe keeping strawberries from getting moldy. And in addition, if you enjoyed this format, you want a little bit more, University of Vermont is offering these cafes on Wednesdays. And they're the ones who uh, got us going on this. And this was their idea first. So I just wanted to thank everybody for telling us what you'd like to see as a next topic or a future topic in the chat box. And thank people for filling out the evaluation. Jesse, do we have any last questions for Scarlett? We do, just uh, there are four more questions. I don't know if the folks who asked them are still here. Um, we have, can a fish get disformed? I'm assuming that deformed. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a, a simple. Yeah, and it, it does happen a lot, actually. Um, so like when I work, especially when you look at species that have a ton of eggs all at once or a ton of embryos at once, so like Atlantic salmon, um, that happens all of the time. And so one of the projects we were working on was actually looking, we um, took movements of female hormones and then we looked at her eggs, how they developed, how many of them developed. And in almost every female, you see some weird developmental deformity. We had, we did, somebody asked about twins, like we actually had twins. We had some that were conjoined um, so that, you know, they shared, you know, some part. Um, I think one we had shared like part of its head. It hadn't completely separated. But because fish like that are having, you know, hundreds to thousands of offspring all at once, um, yeah, you, you get things that, you know, they didn't develop um, in, in the way that we expect. So yeah, if that does happen to fish. All right, um, we have a question. How many babies can guppies have? Um, a lot. <laughs> and in part, uh, you know, at one given time, I, I have heard of a sword tail that had 112. At one time, um, definitely larger females can have more. Mine right now in my tank, they have about four to six every time. But the interesting thing is because they're internal fertilizers, females can get male uh, sperm from males once and they can use that sperm over eight different sets of offspring. And it takes them about 30 days um, to yolk up the eggs, fertilize the eggs, and then for the eggs to develop and hatch. So on a 30-day cycle, a female can have um, continuous broods. And they can, they, they mate all year round um, because these guys live in a super warm climate that doesn't have drastic uh, temperature changes like we do here. So really they can have a, a separate clutch of um, every month and they live about two years and it takes them about six months to get sexually mature. So they have about a year and a half where um, they're at a reproductive age. Okay, we have um, two more questions yet uh, left. One is how big can the biggest fish get? Yeah, so um, how big is a whale shark because that's a fish and that's bigger than a submarine <laughs> fish can get really 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 huge sharks are actually also fish um so they can be really 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 big and then they can be really really teeny tiny too so there's a huge diversity of sizes in fish Okay, the very last question, I um, saved it for last because it seemed relevant to your opening graphic. Do fish get back together after being separated? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I don't really know that I have an answer to that. We know that fish are able um, to, to sense um, family ties or if they were reared together. So yeah, I mean, once they, you know, some form social bonds, uh, just like 
people do, um, especially in these species where um, like some cichlids actually give biparental care, meaning the males and the females care for offspring. Um, and sometimes they keep the same um, part over long periods of time. So I can imagine if you took them apart um, and then put them back together, then again, they would likely form a pair again. But yeah, I don't, I don't know that any research has been done on that. That's an interesting question. And that was the last of the questions from our Q&A box. Thank you so much for answering those. Cool, Carly, yeah. And you. I, I kind of want to just say too that um, if any of you all are near the Orno campus, and you're interested in some of the stuff that I've talked about today, we're opening an interpretation center, we're doing some hands-on activities with high school and middle school students, so um, definitely reach out if you're interested. I'm happy to talk more about um, fish and your interests in fish. Awesome, Scarlett, thanks for coming out today. I think we had some amazing questions. I was so excited to see such great questions from the group. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I hope to see a lot of you next week. I'm gonna end our session now and say thank you once again. Have a wonderful week and I hope to see you next Tuesday. <laughs> Bye.